as dynamic um, a discussion as possible between people that can tell us about some, um, some of the challenges as well as some of the opportunities as digital technology takes over so much of our life, it also shapes politics both national and uh, international, uh, and then responses from a minister who's, uh, uh, who has recently announced some measures to try and uh, protect our democracy from those. So let me start with uh, Wael Ghanim. Uh, Wael is uh, uh, an Egyptian and has done some pretty remarkable things in the past as an entrepreneur and as a, a you don't like to be called an activist, but as someone who has seized the opportunities of the connectivity that the internet offers uh, to accomplish some pretty dramatic things in his home country, he's also seen a lot of the negative aspects uh, that, uh, that social media and that uh, connectivity uh, can bring, the distortions that it can bring to, uh, to politics, and we're looking forward to hearing from him. Among many things that he has done in the past, he founded uh, his own social media platform to try and build a more positive uh, dynamic in online discussions to bring people together instead of to separate them into their own filter bubbles uh, called Parleo, which was acquired by uh, Quora, and we'll look forward to hearing uh, about that. Um, next, we'll have Miranda uh, Bogan from Upturn. Uh, she is an expert in machine learning and artificial intelligence, and particularly their impact on human rights. Uh, Upturn is an organization, advocacy based, uh, an advocacy organization based in the United States, which works on equity and justice in digital technology in four broad areas: in uh, safety and justice, uh, in markets and opportunity, in um, ensuring the right to open and secure communications, and in the way I think most relevantly for the debate here in how technology shapes decision making uh, and power. Uh, she was a Google Policy Fellow, uh, spent some time working on the Hill in Congress, and uh, will be speaking to us about the policy behavior of big tech firms. Next we have Ryerson's own uh, Anatoly Gruz, who's an associate professor here uh, at the Ted Rogers School of Management, uh, and the Canada Research Chair in Social Media Data Stewardship. He runs the Social Media Lab, which is also located in this building, and uh, is an expert in how social media changes the way that people interact in uh, all aspects of our lives, really, in how we communicate, in how we collaborate, in how we disseminate information, and in how we form communities online, all of which have very profound implications for, uh, for how we do democracy. And then finally, um, Minister Karina Gould, who started as a community activist in uh, Burlington, so in the GTA, uh, while she was at uh, McGill, during her undergraduate, she uh, began her exposure and her involvement in international issues quite early, uh, raising a significant sum of money for the uh, victims of the Haitian earthquake in 2010. She went on uh, from McGill to work at the OAS, the Organization of American States, uh, in Washington. Um, did a stint at uh, Oxford University, not Balliol, I'm sorry to say Merrill, <laughs> but the International Relations Program, which I know well, so uh, kindred spirit there. Um, we tried to hire her for the Council of International, uh, the Canadian International Council, when she returned from that, but she turned us down. At least we got her as a speaker. Uh, today. She went to work for the Mexican government uh, instead. Um, and when I, I look at her, her background, I think of that uh, final speech that Barack Obama made uh, the last day that he was president, when he raised the concerns of so many Americans had the direction their country and their, uh, the world is taking, and said, if you're concerned, don't just whine about it. Get out a clipboard and start organizing your own for office. So uh, Karina Gould did that, and she was elected at the age of 28 immediately became a parliamentary secretary in one of our international portfolios in the government as the parliamentary secretary to the Minister for International Development uh, and La Francophonie. And then in 2017, she was elevated to the cabinet in her own right as Minister of Democratic Institutions. Uh, and most notably, uh, she announced in January 2019, so just two months ago, a series of measures to protect the integrity of Canada's elections from some of these trends that we'll be talking about today. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming this uh, impressive panel. I'd like to start with uh, Wael, if possible, who brings um, the voice of experience in 
both the positive and the negatives uh, of how technology um, opens opportunities, both for democracy and for uh, dictatorship, to offer some of his reflections on what he's seen in his own work in Egypt and, uh, and as an entrepreneur. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Ben, for um, inviting me and, and for hosting, and thanks, everyone, for coming. And um, uh, uh, I, you know, I like to think that, from a manner's perspective, I'm aspirationally Canadian. Uh, you guys have the coolest manners in the, in the Western sphere. Uh, so I, I, I look up to your, uh, your, your level of manners, I have to say, all the time. Like, it's hard to see not-so-nice Canadians. Uh, I guess, like, I also, like, even when I see them, I don't believe it. Like, there <laughs> must be something wrong with my judgment. Um, so, um, I happen to be um, uh, working for Google uh, uh, starting 2008, and uh, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm a generation that witnessed the internet. Um, uh, when I was 17 years old, it was my first time to go online. Um, then, uh, started my first business when I was 18. Um, uh, I found my wife online when I was 20, um, and then things uh, got better from there. Um, and then, and when the social media happened in 2008, like the beginning um, of the first event that took place in Egypt, where a lot of people organized to get out to the street, and uh, that was in um, the 6th of April 2008. Um, that was a big event for me because I was working online and I was, all, just like many young people, very frustrated between the gap um, between us and the rest of the world and also the gap between um, what we're learning and what's happening on the ground, you know? It's kind of like our, uh, our government, our teachers, the people we should be looking up to who are teaching us stuff are not really following the stuff that they are teaching us. Um, it's all like a facade for whatever that runs. So I was just like as frustrated as many people and I was surprised to see the impact of social media and I decided to become more and more involved. Um, initially, uh, I started um, a Facebook page for Mohammed al Baradei, a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Uh, at the time, he was using Twitter to communicate with people. He didn't know um, much about Facebook. He didn't know much about Twitter. It was just his way to communicate with the Egyptians because he would not be really like uh, accepted to be hosted on traditional like media means. It was just the government does not have control of that. And things started going uh, further. I don't. I don't want to take the whole time telling the story, but I just basically uh, witnessed the revolution happening, and I was like in the middle of it. I was very optimistic about the role of technology in decentralizing uh, access to power. Uh, but then, um, I just like many people, I undermined the potential chaotic outcomes that, that could come out of that, especially when these business models, um, uh, like the whole thing that we call now the attention economy, uh, never ex never started with a vision to be the attention economy. It's just like a clever way of us to describe the phenomena way more, way past the, the time. Um, and uh, the problem is like, society, you know, from a societal perspective, uh, there's a real challenge right now, which is the growing gap between um, the age and experience of people who are capable of building products that change social norms um, and the policy makers, uh, the people who are uh, in positions exception of power. Exception to Gould, of course. Yeah, <laughs> and that's, that's a great exception, and that's why it's Canada. Um, um, and that gap is like very dangerous because I, I like to think now is like very in a more systematic, boring way. Uh, the difference between this industry and other industries is that to be a very professional oil uh, uh, like Goro uh, and you know to have an executive position in an oil company you're more likely to spend 20 30 years in career um, and by the time you arrive to the top a lot of the people you grew up with are in the top in other places and by the virtue of these connections and the exchange of knowledge and information all the time there's m there's a lot of alignment of interest that happens just organically without anyone trying um, the, that has been lost with uh, when we build virtually because uh, you could actually, at the age of like 20, uh, build something that reaches a billion people before some government agency knock your door and say, hey, hello. Um, and what does that mean is that there is a huge gap uh, uh, 
uh, of you know communication and with that gap uh, it's very easy to misalign interests especially if the world like for example like we talk about social media companies but the really uh, what we should talk about is the whatever that's called casino capitalism it's just like everybody is playing a game we inflate prices uh, buy stuff we don't need um, uh, and then eventually everyone is playing a game there's Ponzi schemes going on all the all the time a lot of the investments are just pure Ponzi schemes I'm an investor I put in money in now because because someone during the IPO time is going to buy that, but we disrupt an industry, uh, bring it down, uh, uh, and eventually someone else has to clean that mess. While we have already uh, been uh, making billions of dollars, and we can do like some good things on the side as well, just to look good. Um, but the reality is that there, there is uh, there is a problem at the root cause, um, and unfortunately, there is no clear path to a solution because. Um, you know, everybody knows that capitalism is currently. In, I'm a cap. I, I believe in capitalism, and I'm a capitalist. But I just believe that it's that the model has been uh, played right now. Like it's uh, it's too gamified. It's too easy to manipulate the system. And once the system is too easy to manipulate, uh, enough number of us make it a non-functioning system for the rest. Uh, so the question is like, how could you actually align? bring it back in a way where you could align the incentives of the companies with that of society. Um, because unless that happens, uh, the companies cannot move in that direction, except if uh, one of the founders of the companies decides to take uh, billions of dollars of hit uh, in, in advertising losses just because they want to be nice. Uh, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, it, they, cannot, they cannot even afford doing that. The CEO will be fired. Uh, the board is going to be fired. Uh, unless you manage to convince all the shareholders uh, to start losing money uh, because it's going to be good for the society. So again, uh, uh, just bringing the, the main uh, uh, picture back is, like, uh, back is like, as we think of how to fix that problem, we need to kind of like upgrade uh, 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 the level of thinking into a systematic problem because Facebook, Twitter, uh, they're, you know, YouTube, they're all just products of the policies that we have created yeah. uh, or the absence of them, uh, uh, whatever the case is. Miranda's uh, definitely going to have some things to say on that topic, but I wanted to give the minister the opportunity to ask you a question or two. Thank you. Is it this one? Yeah, thanks so much. So I have to say, I'm so excited to be asking the questions right now because normally <laughs> the questions are being asked of me. Um, but this is actually. I'm going to be a politician. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Uh, First of all, I'm really grateful to be here because this is squarely um, in the box of things that I'm thinking about right now as Minister of Democratic Institutions, and I'm really delighted to be on stage with all of you. And while you talked about something that I think is the pitch for why young people need to be involved in politics, because um, and it's something that I see. We have tremendously capable uh, public officials and politicians here in Canada, but this is outside their realm of understanding and expertise. And one thing that struck me, I was in Montreal uh, in the summer of 2017, and I was doing a round table with the Mayor's Youth Council. And I asked them what they, how they thought we could get more young people to vote. And they said, we don't vote, we do politics differently. Because we just, we're disrupting, we're doing things in a different way. But if you're not voting, then other people who don't necessarily understand or appreciate the same issues are and they're electing people thinking about other things. And so I guess my question for you, Wiles, how do we, how do we understand this kind of youth mentality of doing things differently, of being disruptive, but integrate or connect it into the actual ways, the real structures uh, that are making decisions about people's day-to-day -day lives? I just think that's a really interesting point that you raised. Yeah, I think that's a tough question, I have to say. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, like, I think the, um, the disconnection that is happening between uh, the, the institutions and the, and the younger people, um, uh, in, in my view, has, um, has different, you know, you can look at it from different angles. One angle is actually uh, there is um, there is un unjustifiable paternalism uh, that happens in the process, as in like 
you know, like older generations generally uh, um, uh, are more resistant to change because of the fact that they have seen things in their lives. They, they can intuitively tell what works and what doesn't to a large extent in a, in a good way, but the younger ones are more willing to try. And eventually, when that disconnection happens and the uh, older stop appreciating the younger, um, the uh, uh, paternalism start happening in a in a way. I, I do. I'm I'm a big advocate of paternalism. Um, uh, I believe that generally speaking, all of us need somehow external forces of discipline uh, in, in a way or another. Uh, it just has to happen at consent, and it has to happen in a, in a way that. Uh, somehow respects the agency of individuals. Um, so in that sense, I think that's one part of the problem, which is uh, the, um, uh, the older generation uh, kind of like, you know, uh, uh, when I look at some of the uh, hearings of the Congress when, when the tech people come, uh, um, and I see, for example, uh, a lot of people who are very, uh, um, uh, you know, they care a lot about family values. Uh, but they are not really looking into how the dating companies are changing the norms of uh, uh, society. Uh, they are really busy with the abortion problem. Why are they busy with the abortion problem uh, and not busy? Because one would say they are probably they care more about the issue. Uh, but actually, that's busted. Because if you care more about the issue, um, uh, there is a lot that's happening on dating uh, sites that I'm not saying you need to regulate. I don't know, but you at least need to pay attention to. But you're not, um, and and to to some extent, when when the uh, the people who are supposed to be oversighting lose that sight, um, it is very hard for the younger ones to actually respect them, uh, or to respect their vision or respect their views. You you really don't know what you're talking about. You're really busy with a problem 20 years ago, uh, but it's actually not the problem of today. So that's one aspect. The other, I think, uh, from the other hand, uh, I uh, uh, I'm I think. Um, uh, 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 there's nothing worse worse in the world than being both uh, naive and arrogant, right? Uh, but then add to the mix good intentions, and that's a disaster. Uh, uh, because you are naive, arrogant, with good intentions, you're less likely to listen to anyone because you're helping a just cause. You're not questioning the cause. And it might not be as just as you think it is, actually. Uh, and it might be, it has more consequences. So from a young uh, perspective, it, uh, I just see that uh, the... Uh, the young people need to uh, be taught to be more responsible. Uh, I think uh, when you aggregate all that power using your applications or software, uh, and then you are not respectful uh, to the fact that a lot of people's lives are affected by these apps. They, you know, they, their lives are could change in in great or worse ways, um, and you are being irresponsible. Somehow, uh, you need to be disciplined by the system. Uh, and if the system doesn't discipline you, and you're able to get not only get away with that, but actually grow, uh, you are an invitation to a lot of other people to do the same thing. Uh, so I, I just think from a, if, if I am part of the young crowd, I'd think of what is it, the responsibility of the young crowd. And if I'm part of the old crowd, I'll think what is the responsibility of the old crowd. And uh, uh, I'm just a big fan of like, every group should just be introspective and problems will start solving with that way. I feel really assured as the oldest person in the panel, there's still some utility for my age. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's really, really fascinating, and I think it reflects that we're almost living in two parallel worlds right now, and depending on your experience of technology, it's a very, very different experience that you live day to day. And it's one of the reasons why I advocate for young people to get involved and interested in politics because their life experience is very different from some of my colleagues, right? And I think it's really important that we're having those conversations, so I really appreciate those comments. Um, I wanted to ask you a, a different question. Um, we know that your background, you have a connection to you know, the Arab Spring and how technology was used. You didn't talk too much about it in your opening remarks. But one of the things that you mentioned was how some of the activists were able to use social media to reach out to people because they wouldn't have been interviewed or found a voice or a, a platform through traditional media. And obviously, the Egyptian experience and the Canadian experience are, are very different, except there are similarities in the fact that, you know, for a long time, if you didn't have um, a point of view that was mainstream, 
it would be very hard to break through through traditional mediums. And so one of the challenges and one of the things I grapple with on a daily basis is this duality, right? In terms of social media, in many ways, is the great democratizer, right? It, everyone has a voice. And if people like your voice, they will listen to you. And you have a platform that you wouldn't have had any other way. But there's a flip side to that, too. Everybody has a voice. And everybody has a platform. Even things that are really distasteful. And you've started a new social media platform that is trying to kind of change some of that. I was just wondering if you could share your thoughts on, on that tension and how we as societies and governments start to think about that. Um, I think that when we started uh, Parlyu, the, the company closed down after a year and a half and uh, the team got acquired by um, uh, Quora, an, an online Q&A platform. When we founded the platform, uh, our thinking was that, uh, unfortunately, the, the mechanics and the culture of uh, other social media platforms are pretty um, rewarding to, troll, uh, to trolls and, and sensationalism and polarization. Uh, why don't we try and create an experience where people could engage, especially ones who are in different uh, positions and they try to, uh, you know, there, there's enough of us, we, we could be a minority, but there's enough of us that appreciate the fact that others could be different, and they're curious enough to understand where that difference comes from. Um, and um, uh, we, we started the platform, what we realized eventually is that uh, 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 it's, it's like, uh, as I put it as a joke, we're trying to sell broccoli to someone who ordered fat burger. Um, and it doesn't work, right? Because they want their fat burger right now. Um, everyone have been um, uh, somehow got addicted into the habit, like not everyone, of course, everyone who uses social media extensively got into this habit of checking social media all the time and getting those uh, uh, dopamine uh, rush from the likes and what, the shares, the comments. Uh, the virtue signaling, whatever that is that people do all the time. And, um, uh, and as you get that, you get used to it so much that other activities become more brain taxing. Uh, so for example, reading, a, reading an, an article um, uh, uh, now is becoming more of a challenging job to the newer generation because they are used to much shorter form content. And content keeps getting shorter uh, without actually people asking themselves, are we making things more simplistic than they are or not? And what does that, how does that uh, deepen uh, uh, the level of shallowness that we're living in? You know, if we, you know, if we all replace the, cover, the proper coverage of understanding new stories with dramatized videos with crazy uh, music in the background um, and expose the 10 year old uh, to that all day long, uh, what do you expect them to be when they are 20? You know, I mean, things all connect back to one thing, uh, 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 which is like how you carry yourself is a is all about the all what you are exposed to. Um, in that sense, I think the responsibility here lays on whomever that's designing uh, 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 the economic system. So when Facebook de uh, uh, decentralized publishing, which is what it did, um, uh, when you decentralize, you should still be accountable to the outcomes. Uh, uh, because if you say publish, you know, the editor job is no longer important and everyone wants a non-editor experience that's driven by an algorithm and you have a way to prove that, that's great, but then uh, you, just like how the editor is responsible of the consequences, you are also responsible of the consequences uh, because you cannot be uh, disseminating a piece of content to 10 million people and then say, well, that's the algorithm that decided and the algorithm is neutral. It, that, it's not neutral. Uh, it's the whole idea of an algorithm is that it, it discriminates. Uh, it say this content is not useful for this person. That content is useful for this person. So it's it cannot be neutral. It's not neutral by design unless it's random. Uh, um, it just decides based on engagement. And the problem with uh, uh, and that's basically the the biggest thing we we have learned. Um, uh, it's like how deep the problem is. When you optimize for engagement, uh, the result or you when you optimize for attention. The result is always bad, just like how when someone, uh, because as animals, we are more likely to engage with um, uh, people who are trying to engage us at the emotional level more than the people who engage us at the reasonable level. And then all these con artists who know how to manipulate your emotions make you more scared, uh, uh, make you more disgusted, make you more, you know, feeling, uh, uh, feel aggressive against someone who should be shamed. Uh, 
you just find yourself engaging more of that content so that more of that content comes in your way and there is no uh, oversight uh, uh, because that oversight um, has not been a function of, uh, of these companies. And it's a pretty challenging position, by the way, if I'm them, uh, because all of a sudden, it's not like we're asking them to start as a small newspaper and grow uh, their lessons and learn and, and make decisions. No, they are at the top of the world, and we're us asking them now to start restricting. Uh, and the more they restrict, the more they're going to upset certain groups of people, and uh, the more there will be more unintended consequences consequences and it's um, to me like one important thing uh, uh, regulators need to do is to actually think pretty quickly about the next ones uh, you know it's because because those ones are problems that we are ready to deal uh, that we're dealing with and it will take time but then there will be the next ones uh, what are what have we missed in the in the previous cycle that we should do in the next cycle well I can't imagine a better segue to Miranda then we'll take you with the next one and she comes from the uh, mosh pit of uh, Washington, where those corporate interests are up against uh, uh, the political discussion, the regulators, and that's with the existing technologies from the past decade. Uh, and now we're looking ahead to a whole brave new world with artificial learning and machine, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So over to you, Miranda. Yeah, so much to talk about here, and, uh, and thank you for having me. It's it's really great to be on the stage, especially with well, because the, the Arab Spring was what got me interested in thinking about the intersection of technology and policy in the first place. But specifically, what I was seeing at the time were these articles in tech oriented uh, you know, magazines, TechCrunch and Mashable, about what Facebook was doing in Egypt, or, or how Google was deciding on like a particular border designation um, uh, at the border of India, or something like that. And I was wondering, you know, how do these companies approach these policy decisions for which they very likely have, you know, few, vanishingly few staff who have any experience in making those decisions, um, and yet they have so much power. You know, the way I think about them is not just a commercial interest, not just the business that's trying to operate around the world, but in fact, in in mediating so much of uh, the public sphere, they're somewhat of like semi-sovereign themselves, and they're making policy decisions that serve their interests, while also kind of navigating the responsibilities they have vis-a-vis -vis the governments in, in the countries where they operate, as well as you know how people, how their users see them, the legitimacy that they have to the you know wider community. So some of the areas we saw this was in the very early days of Facebook and Twitter and Google, they were extremely pro-free speech. Twitter would not take down any sort of extremist content, um, harassment, hateful content. They were like, we're the free speech wing of the free speech party, and that's our ideology, and we're not going to step back from it. Now, over time, um, they were getting more and more pressure to do, to do more because there was so much hateful content going up. People were getting harassed. Um, uh, ISIS was using uh, the platform to disseminate, uh, uh, ISIS and, uh, and other groups were using the platform to disseminate uh, propaganda and, and you know, gaining attention that they might not otherwise have been able to gain. And the company suddenly had to figure out, well, what, what's our stance on this? Do we um, kind of stick with our, our very purist ideology here, or do we recognize that there are other interests that we have to kind of balance? And so I think where that has kind of taken us now, and when I started looking at this, it was a very sort of niche subject, and in 2016, you know, it blew up because suddenly these companies were in the middle of disrupting democratic processes uh, around the world, in our country, definitely, um, and had to figure out, you know, how much do we take responsibility for this because we are the, the place where political conversations are happening. Um, and I think the, the tension that it, that it revealed was that you know, companies may want to do something, they may be responsive to uh, a government that is democratic, that seems responsible, that's trying to work in the best interest um, of protecting democracy, but if they make a concession and say, you know what, we will disclose all political advertising here, then a repressive country was, is going to ask for the same thing, and they might be using it for a different purpose. They might want uh, political ads disclosed so they can go after dissidents. And so I think the companies are stuck in the middle here. They, they have their own commercial interests. They have interests in you know, probably not ruining the world. That would be bad for business in the long run. Um, but they also you know, do have to be responsive to laws in the countries that they're in. Um, but sometimes they push back against those laws because, or, or they decide to pull out of countries altogether. Google pulled out of China. Um, 
over requests for more information than the company was willing to provide to the government. That was a policy decision. They're, they're forgoing an immense amount of money uh, to, to not be there. That was sort of an ideological position they took, although um, that's also, they were also getting a lot of scrutiny from definitely the U.S. government and also users for you know, potentially facilitating human rights violations. So they're navigating the same diplomatic sort of geopolitical space as countries are, except they had to learn how to do it in the past 10 years, um, and they only recently started taking all this seriously. And so they're, trying, they're having to catch up really quickly. And then you kind of intersect with the problem of if the governments uh, that do, you know, can have the capacity to constrain their behavior don't fully understand the impact of, of what, what they have wrought, have wrought in the world, and they can't move quickly enough, the companies don't necessarily have the incentives to move as quickly as is necessary to prevent some of the things that we saw. And I think those interests are aligning more. Companies are recognizing that they have to move more voluntarily because governments uh, are either making bad policy proposals that don't actually address the problem, or they're dragging their feet because no one can agree on what to ask the, the companies of because they don't understand precisely where the problem sat. Um, you know, or they're, they're being threatened by uh, legislation that they would really rather not follow, but they know that they need to do something in order to have that legislation not pass. So they're kind of in this um, space of defining now what is hate speech, what is a political ad, you know, what is, uh, what is acceptable on our platform, uh, while also not angering a whole bunch of other people. As you said, there's a lot of different interests. A lot of these companies are serving hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, and it's hard to, like, there's a reason I feel like that we have countries in the world, if we have different values around the world, and so it's hard to impose kind of one universal set of policies, and that's what they're trying to do. Like, Facebook has these um, what, bi-weekly, weekly meetings now where they're um, trying to talk through uh, their content policies to create these incredibly specific definitions of what constitutes hate speech because they have to then turn it over to the contracted um, content moderators that they hire and they they want that to be as uh, uniform as possible so they don't they don't want discretion in content moderation because then they'll get blamed for being partisan or biased and and so they're having to come up with these universal definitions for what hate speech is you know what free expression means and things like that and that's just I think a position no entity has ever needed to find themselves in is to <laughs> govern two billion people all at once with the same set of values. So there's a whole lot more there, but I think that's where I'll stop. Minister? I mean, I, I think you touched on some really, really interesting and tough challenges that you know, we as the government of Canada are wrestling with as well. And I, I want to ask you two questions. In the, well, uh, so we'll see which comes out. If both of them come out or just one, then I'll ask the other one. But So I, as Minister of Democratic Institutions, try to think of things from our values here in Canada, right? And if you are a company that is going to operate within our borders, you should be respecting our laws and you should be respecting our values that we have. That's very challenging for global companies that are dealing in values and rights and freedoms from their definition. And the thing that struck you, and it's, I've been having conversations with all of the platforms over the past couple of months, is this notion of global policies and universality. And they keep saying to me, well, it's not our job to define it. Well, we actually have definitions here in Canada. So apply the definitions that we have in Canada to the content here in Canada. And actually, we already do that in broadcasting you know, whether it's on radio or television in print. But their position is, we're not publishers, we're just the highway. Whatever happens on our highway happens, right? But it goes back to something Wiles said, and, and you did too, is that at some point you are making decisions, right? And so even if you're saying each individual action doesn't have a person deciding on it, what led to that content did have human input and did have decisions. And so I guess my question is, is how, how do we as governments around the world deal with this? Because we do all have different ideas. Germany has implemented their hate speech laws, and it's the hate speech laws that have always existed in Germany, but they just said they apply online too, 
right? And Facebook has, you know, they have, a, I think, uh, half the people that are looking at content are in Germany now, right? Because they're so worried about that. So they will follow the laws where they are, but they don't want to have to do things individually because they're worried about their bottom line. And it costs money to, to implement different laws. So how, how do we as governments do that? Should we be doing this as individual countries? Um, should we be trying to do something internationally? Uh, are we going to see something that has different blocks of countries organizing? Um, and then how do we view these companies? Because the other thing you started off by saying is that they are they're making really significant decisions that have impact not just on domestic politics, but on foreign politics as well. And Danish has an interesting example. They have a tech ambassador. They're the only country in the world that has basically said about the online platforms, uh, we are going to treat them as essentially a nation state. We have an ambassador in Silicon Valley, right? And his job is to meet with them on behalf of the government of Denmark. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Can I sneak in your second question too? Uh, no, we'll wait till after, yeah. <laughs> um, that was a lot. Yeah, I think this is exactly the issue that my organization, Upturn, deals with. And we're, we're mostly focused on domestic U.S. civil rights law and making sure that discrimination, that civil rights laws that were passed in like the 60s and the 70s are still applicable in today's world where the same sort of behaviors are mediated online. And so just two days ago, maybe even yesterday, there was a big settlement to a variety of lawsuits over what Facebook would do about discriminatory online advertising. And I think this is a case where um, the platforms for so long made the argument that they're not responsible for what happens on their platform. In the US, there's a specific law that, uh, you know, keeps them apart, that gives them immunity from some of those actions. And so they've enjoyed that for a very long time. Um, and I think it's now coming to the point where um, advocates and, and governments even are starting to say, wait, hold up, you know, these laws were put in place for a reason because we learned from our history that we need additional accountability and oversight um, in high stakes situations like elections or, you know, like uh, uh, hiring where, where in the U.S. we have a legacy of, of discrimination um, in how people access economic opportunity. And so I think what the platforms want is to be able to um, scale without limits and anything that prevents them from doing that, they'll fight against. But I think what it's the government's role to remind the companies that inefficiency was introduced for reasons in the past because we realized what the harms were when everything was purely based on uh, whatever people wanted to do. That's why there are laws. And while they've enjoyed um, a relatively lawless sort of growth spurt, um, I think they're coming to a point where even they're recognizing that they don't want to be responsible for reinventing problems that we've had in the past. What we've found is, it, like Europe, Europe is an interesting um, example because when you're talking about privacy law, for instance, they're much more focused on process and what data ought to be collected and what rights do people have about their data. You could be equally, if not more effective, I think we've found, by just saying, these are the outcomes that are not allowed. <laughs> and well, however you want to go about doing that, that's up to you. But in anti-discrimination law in the US, it really doesn't matter how it happened. The point is whether it happened. And then the, the question that I think technology has imposed again is, uh, is, are you able to then determine who is responsible for that thing happening? And I think technology has obscured that. It has made it more difficult to see, to figure out who's responsible and to hold those people accountable. And I think that introduces like another point, which is just that if tech companies are making these high stakes decisions, whether they're doing it within a country's context or internationally, the biggest challenge, and I don't know what the answer, what they ought to be doing, the problem is we don't know what those decisions are. We don't have visibility, there's not transparency into even the policy decisions. I don't necessarily care what the code of the algorithm is because that's not gonna tell me that much about what's happening on the platform. I do wanna see their content moderation guidelines and understand how they're making decisions and understand you know, when they made consequential choices that are going to affect elections. That how are they deciding um, how to classify ads that are talking about a political uh, topic? In the US, the ad transparency tools that Facebook introduced cover not only election ads, but also issue ads, which are really like basically any topic that you would want to talk about that's not just buying a couch. 
Um, and so how are they deciding what those topics are? And so there's, that's really the, uh, most of our work, we see that there are a lot of policy issues and we know there, there are remedies that are needed, but we don't even know enough about the decisions that are being made to know precisely what the remedies are. So I think anything that increases transparency, like you know, requiring Facebook to publish maybe all its ads, maybe not just political ads, any paid content, that seems like something maybe we'd want to know and have researchers to be able to study what sort of uh, paid speech is traversing the internet. We might want to require more transparency around content moderation guidelines, things like that, so that uh, lawmakers have better and a better understanding of what it is they're trying to regulate, rather than just sort of saying, um, this is bad, we need to break up the companies, which is a big conversation in the states, which, you know, if you think about what the problems are, is probably, you know, maybe not the solution that would lead to the that would actually resolve problems people are seeing. It's just an easy one to point to and say, we'll solve it if we just make them all smaller. Um, I think it's really important to figure out what are we trying to solve and can we either say, these are existing laws, these are outcomes that are, that are, uh, um, you know, that are prohibited and it's up to you to figure out how to do them. And if you don't, we're gonna fine you or we're going to um, impose some kind of uh, friction on your ability to kind of, uh, to ignore these laws that we have for a reason. That's what I would say. So my, my second question is about responsibility mm -hmm. and how we determine responsibility. Because one of the, the big challenges is that, and it, both of you have kind of touched on this, is that for some reason as a society, we haven't gotten to a place where we actually see the online world as the real world. It's still somehow happening online, so don't worry about it, right? And even though there are real world consequences, right? You know, we have the case of Retea Parsons here in Canada who committed suicide because of the constant online bullying that she faced, right? We have real world examples now of, you know, um, heads of state using Twitter to make public policy announcements, right? We have, uh, you know, people who are actively uh, pursuing violence because of a conspiracy theory that they see online. But how do we get to a place where we can assign responsibility and hold whoever that responsibility falls to to account? And I think, you know, I've said for a, a long time, like, there's been a blurring of the online and the offline world. I don't think there's a blurring anymore. I think it's directly related and connected. But we really have that challenge of responsibility and accountability. I think I want to turn it back to you and complicate the question and yes. say that is a problem and it's going to be an even harder problem when we're talking about the machine learning tools and artificial intelligence that are even, you know, increasingly powering these technologies. It's not, you know, we're not just talking about online bulletin boards. If that was the case, then maybe the regime where they're not responsible was appropriate. But when they're building tools that have some kind of mechanism, and whether it's to serve people the content that they want, or whether it's to maximize profit, or those things might be the same, um, that leads to outcomes that are the ones we're trying to prevent. And I think that's where it really gets tricky, because if it was purely an algorithm that discriminated with no input from anyone, we we're doing some experiments to say, if we were to run a job ad um, on Facebook, and we didn't tell it who to target. We just said anyone in, in North America would be eligible for this job, so show this job to anyone living in the US and Canada. But it only showed it to men, or like 80% to men, because it, it, you know, the system predicted that men would be more interested in that job. Who's responsible for that? The way the law is worded in the US um, it ought to you know, cover the entity that led to like it, it, it should cover the activity overall, whether there, it was intentional or not. And I think that's where there's some thinking about what are the definitions that we're using, like if, if we're talking about media or um, the, you know, platforms or like who's included in those definitions. But you know, if, if regulations or laws that relate to the outcome that don't prescribe um, really rigid rules of like what counts as intent might be necessary to say, we don't actually know what will cause the outcome, but we need to make sure the outcome is barred, and then we can start to figure out the levers um, that we can change. And a lot of that goes back to the transparency of we need to understand what's going into the system and what's coming out of it so that we can see, uh, we can kind of trace trace back and say like there was a harm here and can we dig into it? Do we have reason maybe like through the court system to, to get more information about what could have happened here? It's hard to say precisely how to solve that 
from the get-go because I don't know what direction it will take. I don't know what, it will, what, what these harms will look like. I just know that it will be really difficult to point a finger at a person or a company or an executive because some, uh, something might happen uh, inadvertently that was due to what otherwise would seem like a benign sort of business process but can lead to the outcomes that we're trying to prevent. Well, if anyone here in Canada spends more time directly observing some of these dynamics uh, in social media with the Anatoly uh, through the social media lab, so I'm wondering if you can offer some of your perspective. Mm. So as I was listening to my fellow panelists, I was reflecting on this dual nature of social media to be forced for good and evil at the same time. And I was trying to think about my journey as a re social media researcher in this space. And what it led me to think about 2011 when Global Mail announced that this was the first social media federal election in Canada. And it was an exciting time. I was at uh, Dalhousie at the time in Halifax. It was an exciting time for researchers to be able to see public sentiments around elections. Uh, sitting in Halifax, I was able to see uh, Canadians across uh, from coast to coast expressing their opinions. Uh, I'm sure it was an exciting time for people who was about to vote to debate and discuss uh, you know, election using CDN poll hashtag. Uh, I'm sure it was a bit nervous, but also exciting time for candidates to be able to reach their voters directly through social media channels. And then three years later, uh, 2014 came, and we were observing events in Ukraine when the Euromaidan revolution happened. And so what we observed um, in our research study where you have both bodies, uh, both sides of the conflict, pro-Russian, a uh, group of activists as well as pro-European -Euro uh, pro Union activists using social media effectively to organize themselves. Uh, but here in the West, uh, the majority said, well, it's in Ukraine. It's on websites on Google VK. It's not going to happen here. And then 2016 came, and when we saw the real effect and power of social media to spread and interfere in political discussions in the US and UK Brexit uh, referendum, so then we said, well, yes, it can happen here in Canada. So what can we do about it? And so I, I'm really, uh, it, it's exciting and scary time to try to understand the, the platforms, the ecosystems that uh, companies build, that we use in, that third party using our data to build on, that uh, government trying to make sense of, and look for solutions. So there is no single solution will solve it. We know that uh, educating users is important. We know that, uh, uh, Technical solutions are important because of the scale of the issue. Uh, it's really impossible to do it to do it just on manual checks. We also know that some regulation and policy solutions are necessary for certain type of content. Uh, but we still at this stage we're trying to figure out and decide as a society what is we're willing to uh, compromise in terms of our ability to share information with uh, our friends and family and strangers versus making sure that bad stuff won't get out of it. Uh, that stuff won't go viral. And so there's no single answer, but I think what brings us closer to the answer and solution is the informed decisions, which would be informed by, by research, uh, researchers being able to access the data, being able to understand how algorithms do, uh, works, as Miranda pointed out. Um, but what we find in ourselves right now in the world uh, where research, academic researchers like myself, experiencing uh, kind of the state of data, uh, being data poor, um, where we don't uh, really have access and understanding how different misinformation campaigns are happening because we don't have data about it. Um, and so going forward, what I want to see at this at an element of this solution, making sure that academics and journalists who are also feeling very data poor uh, actually be able to independently verify and understand the processes, how information uh, on social media misinformation in particular was originated, how it spread, and what was its real effect, online and offline. Great. Question for Anatoly? You bet. Um, so, full disclosure, Anatoly and I sat in a panel together in October 2017 in Ottawa. Uh, it was Facebook's announcement for their original steps that they were going to take to combat uh, foreign interference in our elections. Um, and I feel like so much has changed since then. And I feel like so much by the time we had that panel had changed uh, since the 10 months earlier when I was appointed Minister of Democratic Institutions. And I say that because in the two and a bit years that I've been in this position, we've learned so much about how social media companies operate, 
and what the what we thought were the really good things about them have turned out to be some really bad things about them. And every day something else comes out, right? Like we're constantly learning and discovering things that we didn't really understand or think about before. Because in 2011, social media was really exciting. It was really sexy, right? Like 2015, it was super sexy, right? And it was one of those things that like, you know, and me as a candidate, like, I used Facebook and Twitter and YouTube really effectively. Like, I would go and knock on a door and people were like, I just saw your ad on YouTube, right? Like, and I was, you know, I was 30 years younger than almost everyone I was running against, so nobody else was, was really <laughs> online. Um, and so I personally experienced the, like, amazing reach that social media can have. But that amazing reach can also happen for, like, really, really bad things. And my question to you as a researcher is, do we understand the problem enough to be able to provide a solution? And if we don't, do we have time to figure it out? <laughs> well, if we haven't figured it out by now, it's probably too late for 2019. <laughs> 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 um, so I think the answer is that we know bits and pieces and elements of um, issues that uh, uh, kind of underline the problems. If we look at the mis misinformation campaigns, we do know that it's not just the content that people put out there. And I'm thinking about a project we did on anti-vaccination YouTube videos. It's not just people who are uploading those videos. It's the recommend the system and YouTube in this particular case that was more likely to recommend to watch anti-vaccination videos more likely than watching pro-vaccination videos. So we know that it's not just the content gen you know, generators producer, but it's the platforms that distribute that content. So some related to, to your point earlier. Uh, so if we know that that's the problem, then to, so to understand this, uh, to find a solution, we need to be able to audit this type of algor algorithms. Uh, and I don't think there's a, a clear solution how we can do that. Uh, we can certainly uh, encourage encourage platforms to demonetize some of the spaces, uh, and I think some platforms are going that direction, like YouTube, uh, not to encourage uh, posting content misinformation just to make money for financial uh, incentives. So we know those different areas where we can uh, try different solutions. What we uh, kind of struggle in right now is we're trying to find that single solution similar to what you were referring earlier, this universal rule, set of rules, which probably will not work. That's really interesting. And just touching on the anti-vaxxer mm -hmm. movement, um, the Toronto Star ran a piece by Marcus Kolga a couple weeks ago, or shortly after um, the announcement that I made on January 30th, that was talking about how um, there, there's proven Russian interference in Canada on, on different things. We, we don't know the extent to which that actually has an impact or not, but that not only was it with regards purely to partisan politics, but also that they were running and promoting anti-vaccine messages. And so one of the conversations that we had on that panel was about authenticity, right? And the ability to identify authentic users and call out inauthentic behavior. And we had a bit of a different perspective on that. Um, and so I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the role of authenticity, the importance of you know, because I, I actually agreed with you after you talked about it, um, the importance of, you know, people who may have unpopular ideas to not have to disclose their identity for, to protect themselves politically. But where do we draw the line on that so that we're enabling people to express their opinions, but being able to identify and call out and limit bad behavior, particularly when it comes to foreign interference? It is a struggle, so how do we allow people who legitimately need to be anonymous and express their concerns and speak up versus uh, those same or different people using anonymity to spread hate speech and misinformation. Um, I always come back to the idea of the kind of moderated uh, online spaces and online communities where they can be anonymous, but they still can be very su successful. And the, what makes them su successful is the group of uh, community members trying to self-moderate and regulate. Uh, so Reddit comes to my mind. It's not necessarily the best example of civil <laughs> discussions or lack of misinformation, but there are a lot of communities, especially learning-related, 
ask academia, ask science, ask history, where you can ask questions about all different domains. They are um, moderated by community members who are passionate about, about the topic. The community organizes the rules, what is allowed, what is not allowed. There's even a group called Ask Donald Trump Supporters. And it's actually the group on Reddit where you have civil discussions, meaningful conversations about Trump's policies. And you can actually interact with Trump supporters and ask, why do you agree with that policy? And so what makes it uh, work is a smaller community. Uh, it's moderated by community members, but it's, it's uh, anonymous. So, so it just reminds me that perhaps the anonymity is not necessarily an issue or cause for uh, misinformation and the spread of misinformation. Great. Now we have about 20 minutes left, so uh, you might want to tell us a little bit about the work you've been doing, and then perhaps we can open it up to the audience. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. And I will be very brief so that um, you can pose questions or perhaps solutions um, to this very challenging issue. Um, I, I think uh, one of the things that I love about my job is I think it's one of the more um, intellectual academic jobs um, in the cabinet because it's constantly dealing with and thinking about values, our values, and how uh, we ensure that the rights and freedoms that we have cherish and, and have in this country are protected. Um, when dealing with adversaries who are actually trying to use those very rights and freedoms against us. Um, and so that has been part of the, the problem and the challenge that we've been looking at uh, over the past two plus years. And on January 30th, uh, I announced our plan to protect Canadian democracy for the upcoming federal election. It had four pillars. Uh, the first was with regards to citizen resilience, because as I've talked to experts and counterparts around the world, that you know the best protection for a democracy is an informed, engaged citizenry. Uh, so we announced at that point $7 million for civic, digital, and media literacy. Uh, the budget just came out on Tuesday. I was so excited. Everyone's like, I got a billion dollars in my department. I'm like, I got 30 million. <laughs> um, but it's really important because if we don't engage about democracy and about our democratic values and principles, we stand the possibility of losing it. And I think what 2016 showed us is that you can't take democracy for granted, that you really do have to invest and stay engaged with it. Um, so that's the first pillar. The second one is with regards to organizational readiness. Um, and so uh, right from the get-go, we engaged our communication security establishment to turn their attention to foreign interference, but also to reach out to all of the political parties that are represented in the House of Commons. And despite you know some of the things you may have seen this week happening in Ottawa, um, and in public, in private, we're having really good, honest, open conversations about um, how we protect different political parties and they have a direct line of communications to CSE uh, and there's really good conversations and what I would say is that every single political party is engaged and they don't want to be either a victim or a facilitator of foreign interference and I think that's something we can be really proud of um, in Canada. Uh, Non-Canadian uh, non participant CSE is Basically, our NSA, the And anyway, so that's that's really good news. And CSE is also protecting Elections Canada. Though what I can say, because we are still very old school in Canada and use paper and pencils, we're not so worried about the actual election results themselves. We're more worried about political parties, uh, the media and politicians, because wherever there's a human element, yeah. that's where the vulnerability lies the most. Uh, the third element is combating foreign interference, and so we established the site task force, which brings together the RCMP, CSE, CSIS, and Global Affairs into an integrated unit to monitor for foreign interference, and this is something that is really important. And then the fourth pillar is with regards to social media, and that's the one that I have been working on and engaging with the platforms on for the past couple of months, uh, really talking to them about three principles, authenticity, transparency, and integrity, and in how they operate, because those are the three principle, principles that really underline our electoral system and our elections legislation. And um, when we updated our elections legislation uh, over the past year, which received royal assent uh, in December, those were the guiding principles that we looked at. And one of the questions I asked was, 
of my officials was, okay, looking at elections legislation, what's in there that by virtue of it just being in there that we don't have to change, just applies online. There's no reason why the offline laws shouldn't apply online. And then where are the gaps? Where are the gaps for what's happening online that isn't already in place? And so that's what we tried to do with C76, was to bridge some of those gaps. Some of the things we just don't know enough about to be able to adequately regulate. But the other thing that I'm really proud of is our elections legislation does regulate social media companies. They've been telling me that I can't do it, but we did it. Um, and in a small way, and I'm only responsible for the Elections Act, I don't have any other legislation under my, um, under my umbrella, um, but we did it. They are not allowed, they're uh, not allowed to receive foreign funding for political advertising, and uh, they have to have an ad registry. Um, Facebook has said they will. We're still waiting on Twitter. Google has said they won't. Um, and we're still waiting on Microsoft as well. Uh, and if you are an online platform with 100,000 unique visitors a month here in Canada, you have to provide an online ad registry. That's just one aspect. It's the one we know of. I was hoping, and I hope, I still believe, that the legislation that we put in place is also forward-looking to try to address um, what we don't know, but we don't know what we don't know. Um, and we will have to be agile and nimble. But the idea behind it is that the core and the foundation of our elections legislation is based on those values, is based on those principles, regardless of the platform and regardless of the medium that is used. Fabulous. Thank you so much. We have some time for questions. Uh, there's quite a lot of people here. Um, so I'm wondering whether we should batch the question together. How many people might have a question? Yeah, let's do, maybe we'll do them in threes, if that's possible. Let's start in the back. Um, Thank you very much. Um, very informative. My question is, how can we use technology to go back to direct democracy and start, instead of just trying to fix um, the way it works now? But the angry teenager inside me still asks, why should I go elect someone when I can just when I can just start a Facebook page or a campaign online? Uh, so let's take three questions and then we'll do uh, do a round. Um, we get uh, one for Josh over here. Thanks. Uh, my question is mostly for the minister. Uh, the budget 2019 allocates something like I think 19 million dollars for a so-called digital democracy project. Uh, do you think you could talk more about what this is? It sounds really great, but okay. one more question over here. Uh, I'm just curious. So I've heard a couple of ideas around having like an international governance. Uh, structure for the cyber world, and I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts on that, like how feasible it is, like if it's, yeah. Okay, we start, would you like to start the uh, sure. answers? Yeah, um, so I, I have to start by saying I don't have all the answers, and that's why I come to events like this, um, because there are people who are much smarter and uh, knowledgeable and technically expertise in this than I am, um, so I'm really glad to hear from all of you, and I'll probably be following up with most of you. Um, just on the Direct Democracy Project, uh, it's specifically for civic media digital literacy and research um, and ensuring that we are doing research outside of government um, on this. I can't speak much more because there'll be a call for proposals and we'll have to see um, what we get, but I'm really excited about it. As Canadians, we, um, you know, we, we spend a lot of money and time and expertise on promoting democracy abroad which is good and valuable, and we should continue to do that. But I, I'm really pleased to see that we're now going to be doing, um, even if it's a small amount, that work here at home. Um, and I guess on the uh, direct democracy piece, I, I think we should be doing both, right? I, I don't see them as mutually exclusive. I think that that's part of democracy. You, We have an elected representative. I think that's important because 
you and me before I was a politician, I don't have time because I'm working and I'm taking care of my kids and I have hobbies to read through everything that's going through and you know ensuring that I, I'm informed enough to make decisions to vote on every single thing that we do as a country. That's why we have elected representatives. Um, but at the same time, as a citizen, there are things I care about and I should be having petitions online, I should be engaging my neighbors and friends across the country on things that I care about and advocating and lobbying my elected representatives. So I don't see those as mutually exclusive. And then on the international governance side, I would just say that um, I, I think we have to get to a place internationally where we, where we have norms, where we have international norms with, with how um, how the online companies work and operate, I think that it would be very difficult for Canada to go it alone um, because we're just, our market share is not as big, but I think we're really important because everybody wants to be in Canada because if they're here, then they're, you know, like good and doing things right and so they want to follow our laws. Um, but I, I think, it, I'm not sure about governance, but at least a, a normative framework, I think, is really, really important. Um, but that being said, as was mentioned on the panel, every country operates slightly differently. And you know, just because platforms are worried about their bottom line doesn't mean that they shouldn't operate uh, respecting the laws and the cultures of, of where they are. Other panelists want to take on these questions, Anatoly? So if I answer the first question about why do we so we're not talking about creating new platforms, is that the question? Why do we try to fix old ones? If I understand correctly, if I could paraphrase, for Khaled, I think it was, uh, uh, should we, in addition to focusing on how uh, technology might affect existing practices of democracy, not look at how we could innovate in direct democracy, and perhaps return to the past, uh, some past practice in direct democracy. Did I get that right, Khaled? Say it again. Uh, instead, of, instead of us just focusing on uh, on worrying about how existing democratic practices work and how technology affects that, should we not be thinking about the opportunities that uh, it opens for direct democracy? Can you give us an example? I, guess yeah, that's I, I, was, yeah. I have a cell phone. I believe everyone in this room. We all have cell phones. We can we can vote on every single thing directly. We don't need representative democracy. I, mm -hmm. I can push back. We, we can make decisions on our own, especially in a country like Canada where everybody is almost very well educated. So why don't we do this? So I think it's a good question, but we probably need another hour and a half <laughs> just to unpack that. I think what we're discussing here is before we even go and vote, uh, what are the platforms people are using to debate and discuss politics, and what are the platforms that are being used to, to target us? as Canadians uh, to influence how, how we're going to vote, or our opinions. Uh, so I think it's quite important to understand the current ecosystem before we actually go and innovate. Miranda? Yeah, I think um, something in common between both of those questions is just a, a question of speed. Like, the, the structures of democracy that I think the, the US and Canada share were um, imagined in a, in a past time when information didn't move as quickly. So I definitely feel the temptation be like, why can't our decision making also speed up because we can know things more quickly? But I think at the same time, there's so much more knowledge about every uh, particular issue that comes up, especially when it comes to technology. I spend 50 hours a week trying to understand what's happening in technology to even recommend policies. Like, I can't, ex I can barely expect the lawmakers to understand what it is they're voting on, let alone the public, which you know, when you have to break something down into a very brief yes or no or a sound bite, it, it loses a lot of the important pieces that, that would inform those decisions. And I think you expand that out to healthcare and science policy, defense policy. There are things that the information is just not easily transferred for those decisions. I certainly think that there's more to do. On the international governance, I think the problem is a little bit flipped where the technology itself and the, the platforms, everything is changing so quickly that the process that international governance happens is in, you measure it in decades, not in days. And so I think, I know just a little bit about how um, internet governance happens before, sort of deciding who gets to control what domain names and things like that. And it's 
very rancorous, first of all, and it takes forever because they have to meet, you know, only every four months because everyone's flying all around the world and then they have to debate things and the decisions end up being so delayed that they're, you know, maybe in certain cases where the decisions are relatively static, it, it can work, but here we're talking about things that are very dynamic, and so by the time we got around to making decisions at that level, they, may, they might no longer be relevant. Minister, you have another comment? Well, I just wanted to comment on the speed thing, because I'm kind of a slow foodie for democracy. Um, I, there's a reason why our parliamentary system takes a while to pass laws, and it's because it's complex, right? And it's because we need to understand what's going on, and, and I'm, you know, as much as I know that Canadians are super informed and, uh, you know, intelligent, capable voters, we need that friction, right? I think that friction is really important because it, I think it helps us get to better laws and better outcomes. And so, like, you know, one of the challenges I think we're facing in society right now is that we live in a really on-demand world. Like, I can order food, dry cleaning, everything I want right now from my phone, and it'll be here. But why is the law not changing, right? But the law shouldn't change because, no, it should probably, right? <laughs> but, like, not in this immediate moment because what we're also seeing with this technology is that we are very quick to judge something, and something can go around the world in 30 minutes, and then we realize, oh, it wasn't true, or we didn't have the full story. And so I'm not saying that our system is perfect by any means at all. We don't always make the best decisions, but that's democracy, right? And the point is it's evergreen, and we should be able to change it. But I am a, I'm for slow, not stopped, but slower democracy. Take one more round of uh, questions right here in the front. Um, my question is, how, how do you foresee the government modeling some of the behaviors that you're currently asking companies to undertake? So if we're asking companies to be more transparent and open, you know, doesn't that mean that the government should start by that? Um, so that's one part. And then the other part is also, how does the government establish that credibility of being able to create those regulations if you know, we can't provide government services online just yet? Yeah, and in the back, please, uh, if you have want to direct it to one particular speak, uh, speaker, please let us know. I'd be happy if uh, any of them address this. It's a proposal for cyber peacekeeping. I'm exploring to what extent can you use the same principles that you have in physical space and cyberspace. Could you do have the UN doing reporting? Could you do interposed, uh, creating layers on the internet? Could you have enforcement action? Um, so I'm just interested to what extent you, uh, you feel that you could take some of these principles Cyberspace. Okay, and uh, over here. Uh, <laughs> we should have two runners. Thank you. Daniel um, so, I have one comment and a question. Um, in terms of what more we can do, um, being originally from politics but switched to the technology side of things, but we really need to pay attention to how the massive hacks we see every day are being used to form a smarter misinformation type of this. I think that's one thing I've seen. In terms of my question, I mean, I came down here as a bit of a readiness boot camp for misinformation. So what else should we look out for this year? Great. Um, do you want to start? Do you want to take a crack at some of these? Um, go in the opposite direction this time? Yeah, I like the, um, uh, the question about the internet police. In fact, there is an internet police that's per company. So for example, Facebook could uh, ban you from posting for a week. Um, and then, you know, if you misbehave again, they could ban you for a couple of weeks. They have a certain uh, uh, rule book that they go by uh, to the extent that you might not be able to publish on the platform with your identity um, uh, anymore. Like, as soon as they detect that you are the person uh, you are, uh, no matter what name you use, they will kick you out of the, of the platform. So, and somehow there is, um, there is this notion of policing. Uh, it just happens at uh, at the scale of companies, and actually that poses um, uh, a lot of like uh, questions about like how effective um, uh, there is their feedback mechanism. So let's say I'm kicked out of the platform. Now what? Uh, who do I complain to? Uh, because maybe I think kicking me out of the platform, uh, you know, disable, uh, you know, uh, uh, limit my ability to do business or something like that. Uh, so that that question among the also the question of like 
um, in terms of like policies, how do we tackle this? Because every country has its own uh, norms and cultures and laws. And I, I do think it's kind of inevitable in the future that we are converging somehow into uh, a unified set of rules because from a, from a human scalability point of view, that's the most scalable. Um, and the question is, um, if we don't take a proactive act in defining those rules, eventually those rules will, I mean, somehow those rules exist right now. They're just not written. Um, and a lot of them has issues and problems and they're not well thought uh, about because most of the time they're firefighting rules. You face a bad situation. Uh, you as soon as you recover from the situation, you're trying to create an in a way to stop that from happening. Um, so I just think that uh, uh, with that understanding, it is inevitable that we somehow create that. Uh, um, and it doesn't have to be all countries because that's another thing about humans. Good ideas are uh, very contagious and if they actually make sense, they economically efficient, they're more likely to be adopted by people. Uh, you need to convince people when it's just uh, either the short and long term are bad for you or the short term is, has some downside and the long term is obviously good. And in this case it's much, e much easier because people are actually um, um, you know, there, there's a way to show them uh, what you have is valuable, or th these laws make sense. That there is a reason why the, uh, 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 we operate in a, in a world, despite what we're being told, that mostly work. Um, it works more than it doesn't work, uh, right? Like most of the transactions uh, are honest transactions. Actually, what, what stands out is the dishonest transactions, but they're not the majority. Majority of the transactions in the world are decent um, and, and honest. Uh, but that poses a... Um, a problem because on uh, uh, from a platform point of view um, you know like I trade every every hundred good deeds with one bad deed right like uh, bad deeds are, are problematic and in the era of social media they have collateral damage you know that guy who's um, uh, shooting people and then posting uh, a manifesto um, I don't know how many people downloaded the manifesto how many people are gonna actually read that manifesto and will be inspired by it to do more acts of terror and create that spiral effect so there there has to be that understanding that when you decentralize uh, uh, you actually have to put tighter uh, uh, tighter rules uh, you don't um, be, because central authorities yeah they're by they could have biases they could but but at, at the end of the day they're accountable and they're so interested in making sure that uh, uh, things don't go beyond, uh, uh, over and beyond. But when you decentralize in such a in such a way, and you have no rules, you're just enabling whomever. Like I would answer the question of like why uh, wouldn't we uh, listen to the angry teenager of Khalid? Um, uh, it's because it is the angry teenager of Khalid. Uh, <laughs> we should not be listening to your angry teenager uh, um, because the reality is most of the people. Uh, uh, I'm I'm in technology and I'm uh, uh, I'm completely ignorant about a lot of technological uh, advances. No matter how I act, like I understand, I sit down with people and you know they're saying things and I don't get anything. But I'm I learned how to like just show them that it's okay. Uh, I get it. Uh, uh, and the reality is I cannot make decisions on that. I'm not really informed, and it's very hard for people. Uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm reading a book now called Nudge. Highly recommended. Um, uh, it's it talks about how. Uh, you know, we like to think of people as economicists, uh, like people who are just uh, uh, rational, they make the, all the right decisions all the time. If that's the case, we wouldn't have seen all that polarization coming out of it. Then most of the engagement would have been positive engagements. Uh, and we wouldn't have seen um, uh, 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 whatever happens that happens. I want to address your question pretty quickly just because I, I know I'm, uh, uh, I'm the most liberated to, uh, uh, to say what I want to say. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, think, um, uh, I think that actually uh, uh, there's a very fair point uh, that works on both sides uh, because technology companies have always adopted transparency as their value. Uh, but the reality is they have adopted transparency as a, as a PR tactic. Uh, um, and, um, and once it's not, once it goes beyond, and again, like from a, from a person that would work in these companies, I'm not saying that as a way to say they're hypocritical. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, they're, they're doing what they're doing within a system and they play a certain game. So it's important for both sides to understand, to be, again, more introspective. If you really want to show the tech industry that you are, uh, that you want them to be more transparent, uh, uh, you should show them examples that you are transparent. And by that, uh, you're kind of like pushing them forward. 
The last point I want to make um, uh, here about what can we do, uh, there are two things that are very uh, critical um, in the tech industry. Uh, one is human resources. Uh, so it's um, uh, the whatever problem that any tech company is facing right now, if it's not a market fit problem, it's how to get more engineers to grow the team because we need to grow the, the products. Um, and in such a market uh, where uh, there is huge demand for talent, um, uh, it is uh, one of the very effective techniques is to actually work on the talent, right? Like you basically um, make sure that those people have strong ethical backgrounds, they really have an idea of what is uh, correct and what is not correct. Uh, there are so many things in growth hacking that are very unethical, uh, but uh, I wouldn't blame, blame the people who did it because it was not very easy for them to understand how unethical they are. And then it's just become the cool thing, and then the next work person does it, and it's become the cool thing, and, and, and it keep going that way. The second point, uh, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll stop at that, is, um, uh, is not, is to work on the interest of those companies. Like explain to them what you understand as a politician um, uh, that is hap about to happen to them. Uh, from not from the government, from the government, but kind of like there need to be somebody in the government that helps these companies see beyond what they have, uh, and because it's all their self-interest to actually. Uh, 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 long term to actually make sure that they're aligned with the society. As soon as they lose that alignment, uh, at the end of the day, uh, people could flip on them. People could join another social media platform. It's not of their interest. Thank you. Miranda? Yeah, just, um, first to add on to that, I think, uh, as, I meant, as, as we were talking kind of before the panel, one of the strengths Canada has is that strong talent pool, um, not only in technology, but in AI specifically. That's like a, a resource that the tech companies are salivating over, and I think both in providing those uh, folks opportunities as they're going through their education to think about societal issues and how their work will impact that, but also, you know, encouraging them to be active once they go into these companies, and, you know, there's a, a really growing movement of uh, worker activism in tech companies, um, there's the Tech Won't Build It campaign, and I think, it, you know, if they go in kind of saying, these are my hard lines as an engineer, then they have a lot of power within a company to say, this is what I will and won't do, and you're going to need to respect that, because if I leave, you don't have that many people to replace me. So that's a big thing. Um, on the cybersecurity kind of mo uh, framework question, there's certainly people thinking about that. Um, I think that kind of addresses the, the blurring lines between whether we're talking about nation state actors or individual actors, how do you tell, um, how do you attribute um, behavior online, not just from an authenticity perspective, but is it uh, a nation state that res that's responsible or is it kind of independent actors? Those are like bigger sort of geopolitical questions. Um, on the, you know, how can we expect companies to, to do something? I think there's two pieces here. One, certainly we can expect much more of governments, particularly democratic govern governments. But I think what I think is really missing from the, the companies in this space is there's not even the pathway to expect that of the companies. There's not a mechanism to request transparency or to, or to bring complaints um, where in the government there is, and you might have to slog through a whole process and fight over it and bring it to court, and you know we're doing that in the U.S. right now, filing a bunch of Freedom of Information re uh, Request acts about police technology, and a lot of them are saying, no, that's our information and you can't have it, um, and now we have to figure out how to fight about it, but at least there's a process and they're theoretically required to do something, and we can argue, you can quibble over what exactly they have to give us and not, but there's a way. But the tech companies, there's not that, and so I think you know, they can rise to the level of governments more so in that way. And also, there's, we can encourage companies to be responsible of their own right to be more responsible than governments. I think we don't have to wait for governments to do um, better. We have a lot of situations where the law isn't there, and the law is not going to be there for a while because it moves slowly, but the companies recognize that you know, maybe it's through public pressure or maybe it's through internal, uh, internal pressure that if they don't, if they don't want to screw things up in the future, they have to act. And so I think we can hold them accountable in a separate way that we can hold um, government accountable and, and work on those in parallel. And then finally, I think the what should we be worried about next? Apathy. 
I think people are overwhelmed with all of the information, whether it's misinformation or real information. And you know, I've talked with a lot of misinformation experts and Russian propaganda experts, and that's one of the things that that's their goal is not only is to sow so much confusion that you know don't know what to believe anymore, and you just give up. And so I think that's the thing to be worried about. Absolutely. I want to just touch on the last question about misinformation and boot camps. First of all, I think we need more of those boot camps for all levels, uh, but especially for uh, candidates that's going to be running in the fall. And I think the next uh, fear for them should be those high impact uh, campaigns that would happen perhaps a day before the election, maybe using the fakes that are really realistic videos where, uh, you know, showing something that is not the case. I would also be worrying about uh, homegrown disinformation campaigns. We've been focusing a lot on foreign interference, but in fact, uh, same pe you know, people with similar, with interests that align, uh, shall we say, uh, would be using similar approaches to, to do that type of thing. Uh, it's interesting to like say quickly, but AI is moving faster than we're understanding yet, so we're already working on the last year's issues. Joe, what we're working on for? Yeah. Uh, I think I want to add to that, like, one of the real, uh, one of the real challenges that we're facing, that's why when I said the comment about the, the new ones, uh, I didn't mean to discard the, the old ones, but the, the whole thing about AI, uh, the same, you know, by the time you, the government tries to solve the problem, uh, uh, it becomes far more complicated than it is when, when you can catch it from the, from the early beginning. And that talks to bringing more of the tech people uh, into positions of government, uh, uh, try trying to appeal to uh, to the existing ones who have already made it and, and became rich and whatever to try and, and, and accomplish to try and move uh, their knowledge and experience into the other um, the other side of the spectrum and it's good for everyone it's it's good for the game because it helps uh, uh, um, uh, align the um, uh, align the interests well final word from the minister and then we'll ask Fraser to come wrap things up for us okay um, so I, I pretty much agree with everything that was, was said, and I'll start with the, the last question. Um, and I'll start by saying watch this space, um, because uh, CSE is going to be putting out an update to their cyber threats to, um, to democracy in Canada very shortly. Um, but a couple of the things, is I'll, I'll just pick up on Miranda's point, is that um, apathy and distrust, right, I think is the biggest worry that we have. And it's this double-edged sword of wanting to um, inform citizens about what the risks are, but not scaring them to the point that they don't trust any information that's coming at them. So it's finding the balance of providing the tools and the mechanisms and the resources to make informed choices, but not automatically discount everything that they're seeing and make it be noise. And they turn off and they just say, I don't want to participate, because that is absolutely the objective of those that are trying to undermine our system. Um, and I think the other thing, and picking up a bit on Anatoly, is that um, you know it may not be the same actors that we've seen in other places around the world, but now they there are others who know that they can use those tools, and so we should be mindful of copycats as well, right, that are trying to do the same kind of things. Um, <coughs> With regards to cyber peacekeeping, um, it's, a, it's an interesting idea, um, and I think that it's something that I hope uh, academics are looking at when they're thinking about the cyber world, combat, peacekeeping, uh, foreign relations, about how uh, those tools are, are used and changing things. Um, and we need to we need to be really thoughtful, I think, about this as well, and careful because, as we've been saying the whole time, uh, there's many things that are are really good uh, outcomes with regards to the cyber world, and then there are unintended consequences as well. And so we need to be deliberate, intentional, and thoughtful with regards to this. And with regards to your first question, um, government is necessarily different than the private sector. And government has different responsibilities than the private sector. One of the things that I've, you know, been frustrated by for the past couple of years is, you know, citizens willingly give all of their data to private companies. But if the government comes, they say, don't touch my data, right? But for good reason. Because private companies can't arrest you. Private companies can't tax you. Private companies can't intrude into your private lives the way that governments can 
and need to, to make sure that we're upholding the rule of law and society. And so we have certain mechanisms in place in the Government of Canada, first of which is the Privacy Act. That means government departments can't share information between them to protect those fundamental rights. But the flip side of that is because of the Privacy Act, we can't have a Canada.ca app where you can access all of your services because those government departments can't share information. And so we have to make sure as government that we are fulfilling our obligations to citizens to make sure that we are upholding their rights and their freedoms, but also operate in the 21st century uh, to make sure that we're delivering services to them that meet their expectations. And then, because if we don't, then they're just going to turn off of government. And so I think this is one of the really real challenges that we're facing right now. And in a sense, similar to big tech companies, that a, an ecosystem and a structure that exists already is harder to change than one that you're building from the ground up. And so uh, this is where we have to make sure we continue to be that a reliable uh, government, but meeting the demands of the 21st century. And the other thing that's different about government is our the number one reason why you have a government is to protect your citizens and to ensure that their rights and freedoms are being upheld, uh, at least in a democracy. Um, but uh, that's you know that's how we organize ourselves, and so we need to make sure that we're doing that. Private companies don't have that same responsibility, but they have to, and this is why we have laws and competition laws and anti-whatever laws uh, that you know ensure that they are fulfilling their obligations as members of that society. And so these are some of the conversations that we are having currently in government um, and I think is going to be the, the really big challenge that's facing us on the horizon. That's great. I'll turn to Fraser Mann then to close things up, the host of CIC, uh, our host today and the president of CIC Toronto. Thanks very much, uh, Ben. And I'm uh, very much conscious that I'm all that is separating you from food and drink and spray late on a Friday afternoon. So I'm not going to be long. I'm sure someone has arranged for the music to start playing if I go over. Um, let me first, I just wanted to acknowledge the uh, presence of Greg Stanford, the U.S. Consul General in Toronto. Uh, we appreciate your uh, support and your attendance uh, today. Um, and I really, my message, my main message today is a message of thanks uh, to our panel and, and to Ben, our moderator. Uh, Minister, I heard there were one or two other things happening in Ottawa this week, so we do appreciate your coming. Um, we appreciate the work that you're doing to protect our democratic institutions in the, certainly in the coming election, and we demonstrated uh, the obvious skills you have not only in answering questions, but in asking questions as well. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming to Canada. Um, we've heard a lot about the activities and the sacrifices that you made eight or nine years ago. Uh, we recognize that. And um, to return the compliment, if you decide to come to Canada anytime, I think you would be <laughs> welcome. Uh, Miranda, thank you very much. As a technology lawyer, I get the sense that you perhaps share the skepticism that I have about AI and the possible negative consequences of that. And Anatoly, I'm not going to thank you for coming a long distance, but <laughs> thank you for coming um, and thank you for your work on social media and how it's affecting how we live and how we conduct business and how we carry on the elections. And Ben, uh, thank you very much. Um, we are officially the sponsor, but this program is Ben's inspiration. And uh, due to a lot of work by Ben and by Nikolai and Daniel of the National Office, thank you. Um, <clears throat> ben, by the way, has been president of CIC nationally for about four months, and I think you're starting on national tour. Uh, CIC has about 15 branches across Canada, so if you decide to move to another part of Canada, CIC is there for you. Uh, thank you to our volunteers at the registration desk, and thank you also particularly to uh, the uh, DMSED and the Digital Leadership Lab at, uh, at Ryerson. Um, we really appreciate the space. 
Uh, as a volunteer organization, we're always trying to find new spaces, and I really like this one. Uh, so, and, and thank you. And take care. I want to make sure I get the right names, but uh, Kareem, whom you heard from at the beginning, and also Sheriff El Tawil and Alyssa Torres, thank you for your work. And, and thank you to the audience. Um, our Eventbrite registration system is set up in such a way that I get noticed every time anyone registers. So of course my inbox was starting to fill up and I was very pleased about that. So thank you all for coming in for your contributions. And finally, I think the final message is that uh, this is not the only event. Um, CIC Toronto, we're a volunteer organization within the branch, but we try to organize about 14 and, or 15 events a year. Um, I left some material about some upcoming events in April. April 8th, uh, we have a presentation by the uh, British Consul General in Canada, uh, dealing with uh, Canada-UK relations. Uh, I wasn't sure if we should call it kind of post-Brexit, pre-Brexit, mid-Brexit, no Brexit. Wasn't sure, but we're, we're, we'll challenge him and it's your opportunity to ask him questions about the future of uh, UK and relations between Canada and the UK. And then on April 26, uh, we have uh, Jonathan Manthorpe, who has written a book called Claws of the Panda, dealing with the China-Canada relationship. And as you can perhaps tell from the title, he has certain strong views. Let's say he's probably not going to be invited on a book tour in China. Uh, but again, it's your opportunity. We don't shy away from controversial topics or controversial speakers, so we hope you'll come to that. So, and by the way, if you're not a member of the CIC, please join. If you're a student, it's really financially beneficial, so uh, please just go to the CIC.org, find out more about us, and we welcome you at any of our events. So with that, I think we can conclude, and uh, please join the panelists. Uh, first of all, please thank the panelists for their attendance today. Thank you. And now I think the panelists can join us at the reception at the uh, back of the room. So, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I am happy to be here. That was very good.